Amen. James chapter 5, verse 13, and here's what it says. Is any among you suffering or sick? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will, in fact, be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Today I want to talk about prayer is still the answer. Prayer is still the answer. Now, I know we practice in social distancing, so I'm going to ask y'all today, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, prayer is still the answer. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I believe that the most powerful thing we have in our possession as Christians is prayer. I also believe that prayer is perhaps one of the most underutilized tools we have in our toolkit. Prayer is the greatest Christian privilege, and prayer is the greatest Christian power. Yet I believe that prayer may be one of the most neglected areas of our Christian life. Some question the validity and the value in prayer. And the question for some people is, does God really hear my prayers and are my prayers effective? What I want to share with us on today is not only the validity of our prayers, but the value of our prayers. That when we pray, God promises he will in fact answer. In six short verses, James, the brother of Jesus, mentions prayer seven times. In six verses, he mentions the importance of prayer. And watch what he does as he mentions the importance of prayer. He repeats it so that we might recognize it. And I want you today, if you're at home, if you're here in-house, to take copious notes. The first point I want to lift up is notice what he shares with us. He gives us an exhortation to pray. Let the church say exhortation. Exhortation simply means to urge and to strongly advise. That what James does is that he advises us for any and every problem that we face that we can in fact pray. He says, whenever you are suffering, pray. Whenever you are sick, pray. Whenever you are in sin, pray. He says, prayer is good to be used, watch this, for suffering, for sickness, and for sin. He says all of these areas and all of these issues, prayer is still the answer. Watch what he wants us to understand that prayer addresses every issue in life that we face as humans. For every ache, for every ailment, for every issue, prayer is still the answer. I shared with you all this that my mother grew up in a family with 10 siblings it was 11 of them. She's got six brothers and she's got four sisters. And they lived in a three-bedroom house. She said they did not have a whole lot of money to go to doctors and to get medicine when they were young. I said, well, how did y'all deal with the issues when you had sickness or you had illness? She said, we reached for aspirin because that's all that we could afford. And we discovered that aspirin addressed every ailment that we had. She said, when we had a toothache, we reached for aspirin. When we had a backache, we reached for aspirin. When we had a headache, we reached 
preached for aspirin. Aspirin address all of our ailments. She said for every ache and every pain and every issue, there was one thing that they used that addressed them all. See, I want you to understand that prayer can be used for every single issue and ailment and ache and pain we deal with in this life. For your headache, you ought to pray. For a backache, you ought to pray. For a toothache, you ought to pray. For a heartache, you can pray. For every struggle, you still can use prayer because prayer is still the answer. And this is what James wants us to understand, that for every dilemma and every discomfort and every disturbance, prayer can still address it. And I think that in our society, we've moved away from God's prescription to pray. That in our education and in our knowledge and in our understanding as people, we begin to substitute prayer for everything else. No, let me say it another way. We've used everything else in the place of prayer. So instead of us praying, we look for professional counseling. Instead of us praying, we sit down with a shrink. Instead of us praying, we look for prescribed prescription drugs. And all of these things in their own area and right are good, but not None of these things should replace prayer. Spend time with a therapist, but pray. Take your prescription, but pray. You ought to go to the doctor, but still know how to pray. Because prayer is not only potent and powerful, prayer is practical. And I'm a practical person. I want you to understand that I'm not so heavenly minded, that we are no earthly good. I understand that there's some natural things, and God has given doctors wisdom and understanding standing and God is a healer whether by medicine or miracle. God is a healer whether by surgery or supernatural. God can use both of them but God says what I want you to do is pray. When you go to the doctor, hear what they have to say. Take the prescription but on your way to get your prescription filled, you ought to be praying and say I don't know whose report you going to believe but I still believe the report of the Lord. It's practical. This book, James, is perhaps the most practical book in the New Testament. It's practical because James is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament book of Proverbs. It has wisdom. It has all of these practical tips of advice that it shares with us because prayer is still practical. Prayer can heal you when the doctors came. Prayer can pay the bill when you don't have the money. Prayer can persuade the judge and the jury when your lawyer cannot. Prayer can fix the problem on your job when HR can't fix it. Prayer Prayer can work better than your negotiating skills. Look at your neighbor one more time and tell them, neighbor, prayer is still the answer. And there ought to be some blessed oil. We ought to trust in what God can do over what everything else has told us. Because what we must understand is notice what James tells us. I don't care what it is. You still got to learn how to pray for yourself. Can I give you this real quick? You ought to have some blessed oil in your medicine cabinet sitting next to your Tums sitting next to your rubbing alcohol sitting next to your Rolaids sitting next to the other medicine that you have and you ought to learn how to lay hands on yourself and say I'm going to get better. You ought to be able to go in your child's room lay hands on your child when they are sick and say we still believe in the power of prayer. Is there anybody here who still knows that prayer is is the answer. It's an exhortation. He says, watch this, write this down. Prayer can address every ailment, but prayer can also be the antidote to anxiety. You want to worry less, pray more. See, the problem is we tend to panic rather than to pray. We overthink and underpray, and we become overwhelmed. And because we don't pray, we begin to hear all of this negative news, all of this press, and it causes us to go into a panic. I'm going to say it again. Y'all got to understand that the same people who sell the panic sell the pill. That some people profit off people being filled with fear, worry, and anxiety. I, I saw the other day where somebody was buying up all of the toilet tissue online before this issue came, and they started selling 
selling it at Amazon and online and they've made profits off of it because some people profit off other people panicking. This is why you got to make up in your mind. I am not going to be shaken. I'm not going to be moved. I'm not going to be filled with fear. I'm going to take every proper precaution. In fact, I'm elbowing today. I'm not shaking hands because I do believe in being practical. But at the end of the day, honey, I know how to pray. I wish I had somebody up in this house who would just give God some glory. If you ever been sick, but you prayed and got well. If you ever been in a problem, but prayer brought you out of it. If you ever been in a tight or a jam, but you prayed your way through when you couldn't think your way out of it. Make some noise up in this place if you know prayer is still the answer. James wants us to get this. He says, if the issue is big enough to bother you, it's big enough for you to pray about. Because we tend to think, I'm going to pray over the big stuff, but I'm not going to bother God with the small things. Is there anything big to God anyway? Y'all missed it. God says, I want you to bring me the big stuff and the small stuff at the same time because whatever gives you mental or emotional anguish you still need to bring to God. God says bring me the big stuff and bring me the small stuff because the small stuff it's what gnaws at you. There was a missionary who went to Africa for the first time and he was so afraid because he had to spend the night out in the bush. And he knew that there were lions out in the bush. And so he was so afraid about it that when he went down to sleep that night, he prayed, God, protect me from the lions. But he woke up the next day with whelps all over his face, all over his, all over his body from mosquito bites. And one of the local Africans looked at him and told him, you prayed about God protecting you from the lions. You should have prayed that he protected you from the mosquitoes because it was the small stuff that got you. It was the small stuff that gnawed on you. It was the small stuff that messed you up. I came to tell you everything big or small, you still ought to bring it to God. Pray for your children's college tuition. Pray for a good parking space when you have a meeting. Pray for God to show you what to wear when you got to go somewhere. Pray for God to help you begin to be more peaceful. Is there anybody here who knows God hears you when you pray? And he says, don't worry about anything pray over everything that means we are to pray always about all things and when we pray always about things we will find ourselves less anxious when we go to God in prayer we won't panic we'll have peace you want less worry pray more because some of us are paranoid about things because we don't pray like we should. We talk to everybody but God and we get their advice and we get their counsel and we go to God last. No, prayer should not be your last resort. Prayer should be your first response. You ought to automatically respond when something hits you to pray because some stuff you're not going to be able to pay your way out of, think your way out of, strategize your way out of, negotiate your way out of, some stuff you are only going to be able to pray your way out of it. And prayer is a means of both prevention and cure. Okay, so the first point, y'all got it, write this down. There's an exhortation to pray. But then he tells us about the effectiveness of prayer. Everybody say effective. Now, I know that I've already shared to a certain degree about the effectiveness of prayer. But if your prayers personally are going to be effective, here it is, they must first be persistent, they must also be pure, and it also must have some passion. Y'all missed it. I'm going to say it again. I'll come back. It's got to be some persistence because we think that the first time we pray, God was supposed to answer. And we get frustrated when we don't get what we want at the time we thought we were supposed to have it. 
So we say, what's the use in prayer? Is my prayer really being effective because I've asked and I've prayed, but I didn't get what I was looking for. Just because you didn't get it when you wanted it doesn't mean it's not on the way. Just because it didn't happen when you thought it should. He's a God you can't hurry. He'll be there, don't you worry. He may not come when you want him to come, but he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. I wish I had some people who would help me on this morning celebrate and worship the God that we serve because prayer, if it's going to be effective, must be persistent. This is why Jesus said, watch this, write this down, doors. Look at the smooth transition by the Spirit. I shouted when it began to come to me. Watch this, doors. Ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be open unto you. Because you have to trust God that when you ask, seek, and knock, God is going to respond. But he may not respond when you want him to respond. And he may not respond the way you want him to respond. But God will always give you an answer. But you got to have some bulldog tenacity that says, I'm going to keep on asking. I'm going to keep on knocking. I'm going to keep on believing until God opens up the door door. Jesus gave an analogy and an illustration of a woman in Luke chapter 18. He shares that this woman had importunity. That means that the woman was willing to be persistent to get what she wanted. Her son was being dealt with unjustly and unfair. And the Bible says that she went to the judge who neither loved or feared God or man. But the woman staked outside the courtroom she tracked down and stalked the judge at every turn and the scripture says because the judge neither feared God nor man but the woman kept bothering him until she got her blessing you better learn how to bother God till you get your blessing you better say I'm staking out on this one not my child not my career not this issue God I believe that if I keep on asking and knocking on the door I'm going to keep on bringing it up God what about that issue I keep asking you about. I'm going to keep on bringing it up, keep on mentioning it. Matter of fact, I know not all of us got saved at the altar. Is there anybody here glad that even though you were in your sins, somebody prayed for you, had you on their mind, kept on bringing your name up, kept on pleading the blood over you. And the reason you're here today or online watching this service is because you are an example that prayer still works. It's got to be some persistence. Number two on that is also got to be some purity. If prayer is going to work for you, the text says prayer works for the righteous man. Don't miss that. The effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous. That's the person who's in right standing with God. The person who is righteous God hears their prayers because we must realize there's some conditions that God has placed on us for our prayers to be heard. Realize in order to be heard by God, you got to be in good standing with God. Not all prayers get to God. Some prayers don't make it further than the ceiling because the scripture says your sins have separated you from God and your iniquities have hid his face and Proverbs chapter 15 says the Lord is far from the wicked but hears the prayers of the righteous see prayer is communicating with God he gives believers an open line to his throne room but you can't communicate with God properly if your lifestyle is out of sync because the psalmist said if I regard iniquity in my heart then the Lord will not hear me I don't know about y'all but there's some stuff I gotta let go of so I can get in tune with God there's some people I forgive and it's really not all about them it's about me having a clear line of communication with God because if I don't forgive them God
God cannot forgive me. And I don't know about y'all, but I wake up every day needing brand new mercies, needing to be forgiven all over again, needing God to separate my sins as far as the east is from the west. Have I got help? in this house who knows that if your prayers are going to be answered you got to have some purity I was on the phone with somebody the other day and it was them not me we were on the phone and the call dropped and when the call dropped they called me back and apologized and said I'm sorry I was in a dead zone or a bad place so the reception was bad and the call dropped so I'm calling you back they realized that the reason the call dropped was because they were in the wrong space when we were conversing. So they had to leave the place they were in, shift into a better place so that the line of communication and reception would pick up clearly. See, God says, it ain't me, it's you. If you having issues getting a hold of me, I'm always where I've always been. I need you to return back to me, get some stuff straight in your life so that when you call and communicate with me, I'll hear you. Is there anybody up in this place who knows life is too short, issues are too real for me to get out of place? I need to stay in tune with God. And he says there's got to be some persistence and some purity. Here it is. There's got to be some passion. I want you to understand this. Those who are online, please hear me. If your prayers are going to be effective, you got to have some passion behind them. You can't have these little soft-spoken prayer requests. Can I be real? God responds to passion. God responds to people. This is why we fast and we pray because God responds to sacrifice. So when you are praying, you ought to pray with some level of emotion and intensity. Okay, come back to the text. The scripture says that the effectual fervent, fiery, faithful. Pray means to have fire in it. God says that when you pray, I want you to have some fire in your prayers. In fact, Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, prayers that do not have fervency do not mean praying at all. Let me say it another way. He says, he who prays without fervency does not pray at all. When we commune with God, there ought to be some fire and there ought to be some faith. Your prayers should be spring with faith but they also ought to be presented with fire wasn't it in first samuel chapter 2 when hannah went to the house of the lord and she was trying to get pregnant with the child the bible says that she gave it all that she had she prayed and said god i promise you if you give me a child i'll give this child back to you god i'm giving you the best that i got and i'm giving you all that i have she left it all at the altar altar she put forth blood sweat and tears and walked away and God answered her prayers wasn't it in Exodus that when God finally showed up for the children of Israel that God said I've heard your cries your prayers and your petition wasn't it Hagar who was in the desert with her son and her son was about to die but she lifted up her son with tears in her eye and said God revive my son and the scripture said God heard her the psalmist said I love the Lord he heard my cry and pitied every one of my groan every now and then when you pray you ought to say I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm not going to get up until I get through I'm not going to turn this thing loose I'm going to cry aloud and spare not I wish I had some people who realize it's praying time that if we're going to see a turn in this nation we better begin to cry out to God and ask him to turn some stuff around. Somebody shout passion. He says, there is an exhortation to pray. There is the effectiveness of prayer. And then he gives us an example of prayer. I love this because he does not just tell us what we can do now. He points back to a powerful person of prayer. He brings up the prophet Elijah. Do you know who the prophet Elijah is? 
The prophet Elijah is so powerful that when Jesus shows up on the Mount Transfiguration, there is Elijah on one side and Moses on the other. Elijah was there representing the prophets. Moses was there representing the law. And Jesus, God in the flesh, is between the prophets and the law, saying, I am the prophet who fulfills the law. He says Elijah prayed just like we pray. He was a man with the same passions you and I have. What do you mean? He had emotions just like we did. He had struggles just like we did. He had had fears just like we did yet he still believed enough in God that when he prayed there was a drought for three years but he went back to God and prayed that God would send the rain and the economy of Israel was turned around all because of Elijah's prayers Elijah prayed so powerfully that God turned the rain back on and he changed the climate and condition of the country pastor why are you saying Saying that I'm gonna come back and deal with the importance of intercession but Elijah points to us that the people of God when we pray have more power than the president have more power than the governor have more power than the Congress have more power than the Senate and if we gonna see stuff turn around in our country God is looking for some people who are called by his name who still know how to get in tune with God God, this is why if they're talking about four, six, however many weeks, we're going to be praying until God turns things around. I need you to look at your neighbor one more time and tell them, neighbor, prayer is still the answer. When you don't have the money for the bill, when you don't have the answer for the issue, when you don't have the solution, you still can call on the name of the Lord because the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and find safety. Somebody holler up in this place if you know prayer is still the answer. I'm gone, 8.30. Not long ago, I had a headache. And uh, I was so sick, I was laying on my couch and didn't feel like getting up. I was so sick, I didn't feel like going to the doctor. You ever been that sick? I was so sick, I couldn't get up. I had a migraine headache. And finally, my wife came home. I was hoping she would nurse me back to health, and of course she did. She's a good wife, but she also told me, she said, there may be some medicine in the cabinet. So I got up, and I reached for what always treats my headaches, Excedrin. Excedrin, the migraine medicine. So I reached for Excedrin, but when I grabbed the Excedrin, I noticed that there was an expiration date that had already gone by. I said, I don't think this is going to help me because it's expired. She said, don't pay attention to the date on it. Don't pay attention to it being expired. It still works and it still got what you need. I took her advice and took the Excedrin and wouldn't you know, despite me thinking it was expired, despite me thinking it was outdated, despite me thinking and it would not work. When I took it, I felt better. When I took it, it gave me power. When I took it, it gave me strength. I stopped by to tell somebody on the day, don't worry about the world and what they're saying about prayer. I don't care if they're saying it's outdated and antiquated. I don't care if they're saying that was the time he moved. He's not going to move like that no more. I don't care if they're telling you prayer is expired. Prayer is still the answer. Is there anybody here who can give God some some glory if you've ever prayed and God move is there anybody here who can give God some glory if you ever prayed and he made you better is there anybody here who's ever lifted up your hand and said father I stretched my hand to thee and God showed up to where you are I dare you to stand up on your feet open up your mouth and give God some glory if you know prayer is still the answer Stand on your feet. I'm gone. To those who are online, I want you to get this. Don't tune out just yet. God is calling for us in this season to pray. God says, I want you to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to pray and seek after me because you all have more power when you pray than the world has. Have I got a witness in here? 
Anybody in here know that your prayers availeth much? Hey, thanks for tuning in to this video broadcast on the day. I trust that it really bless and transform your life. I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you can hear more messages like these. I want to also encourage you to invite all your family and friends to sit down and enjoy these messages with you so that they can be blessed as well. You can also stream us every single Sunday here at New Direction Church. Well, that's my time. I look forward to seeing you all soon. God bless you. Take care.